to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. So uh, on November 21st, there was a parade that was happening in Waukesha, right here in Wisconsin. And as people were enjoying this Christmas parade, there was a man who deliberately drove his SUV right through the parade. Many of you have probably already heard about this. Uh, so far, the count I saw was that he's killed six people. Over 60 were injured, and this includes children. Now, when I first heard the news, I could not believe what I was reading. I was shocked. But more than that, I was angry. And then I was sad at what was happening in our world. And then as I was going on social media, I saw stories rolling in, and there was actually people that I knew who were there when it happened. Maybe some of you know, know people who were there when it happened. And some of them, they had their kids with them. And there was one woman who said, one moment I was just enjoying this parade with my children. The next moment I'm trying to shield them from this danger. And now she's walking through the trauma that was caused by that event. And she said it was by far the worst day of her life. What happened that day was evil, reckless, completely unnecessary. There's no meaning to it. And so it's moments like that that we will audibly ask out loud, what is wrong with this world? It's moments like that when it feels like the darkness is winning. It's moments like that where we begin to lose hope. And we can even, we can even just start to ask, what's the point? What's the point of any of this if this is the way the world is going to continue to go? Well, as we continue our series called The Seven Letters of Revelation, we're going to read a letter today that was written by Jesus to a church that was feeling discouraged. And they needed to be reminded to not let go, but instead to hold on. That was his message to them, and I think we can take encouragement from that today. So let's get into the letter. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And here are the words of Jesus. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. So he says he's placed this open door in front of them. But before that, he describes who he is. All these letters begin with a description of who Jesus is. And here he tells them that he is holy and true. So he's reminding them that there is no evil in God. There never has been, nor will there ever be. He is completely holy. But he also says that he is true. In the Old Testament, uh, God is often referred to as the Holy One. So Jesus is reminding this little church that the same God that's declared in the Old Testament is Jesus himself, that he is the Holy One that the world has been hoping for. So he's reminding them of these truths of himself, but then he goes on to say that he's the one who holds the key of David. See, when the Bible talks about someone holding a key, it's a reference to authority. This is someone who has a certain amount of authority. But what is the actual key of David? What is the specific key that they're mentioning here? Well, this is actually an allusion to something that the prophet Isaiah wrote. And Isaiah, he, he told the people something about a man who originally was serving in the royal court. But later on, scholars realized that, like Old Testament scholars, before Jesus was born, realized that this verse was actually a prophetic messianic verse. And so in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, it says, I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. 
and what he shuts, no one can open. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? See, Jesus just said this because he is echoing the scriptures here. He is telling them he is the one who holds that key, that he has the authority, that he's got the authority of the, the royal line of King, King David. So he's the king over Israel. He's king over his church, and he's king over the entire world. He's the one who has the authority. And then he says he can open doors no one else can open. He can shut ones that no one else can shut. What is this supposed to mean? Well, it can mean a few things. One is that God is the one who opens up the scriptures to us. We cannot understand what this book says until the Holy Spirit reveals it to us. That's why we should always pray, Holy Spirit, speak to me when we read these words. But also, God is the one who opens up doors for the gospel to be preached. But as we see in Acts chapter 16, he's also the one who sometimes will close a door so that the gospel won't be preached somewhere until it lines up with his timing. Then we also see that God is the one who opens up the way into the age to come. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus himself is the door. He is the gate. And he is the one who opens that gate to all who would believe. But there's a day where he's going to close the door. As we see in the parable of the virgins and the oil, those who were prepared were able to enter in. Those who were not, when they got there, the door was shut to them. So there will be a day where Jesus closes that door into eternal life with him. And if nothing else, many scholars believe and agree that what he is saying here is that there is an open way in front of the church in Philadelphia. That there is a door that he has open for them that nobody else can close. That he is the one who makes that take place. And he's reminding them that they cannot lose hope. Now, some of you, you might be thinking, you know, a couple times he's mentioned Philadelphia. Is this like Philly in Pennsylvania? Is this, is this the same place? Uh, no, long before the, the Philly of the founding fathers and cheesesteaks, there was a little town called Philadelphia in Asia Minor. And it actually was founded 200 years before the book of Revelation was written. And so uh, this town, it existed for quite some time. But here's the really ironic thing. Uh, we have to remember what the word Philadelphia, what it actually means. It means the same thing then as it does now. The city of brotherly love. See, we all know that. The irony is that for this little church in Philadelphia, they were experiencing anything but brotherly love from the town that they lived in. They were being persecuted for their faith in Christ. And so here's what Jesus says to them in the next verse. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they're not, but are liars, I'll make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. So a few weeks ago, Pastor Joel told us who this synagogue of Satan is. These are people who, uh, they, they, are, they are terrible to other people in their community. Uh, Jesus himself says that they're, they say they're Jews, but they're not actually Jews. So these are people that maybe were born with Jewish blood in their veins, but they don't live by the ways of God. And instead, they're actually haters of humanity, mutilators of flesh, false teachers, people who are destroying the faith of both Jews and Gentiles, non-Jewish people, who are trying to find faith in God. They're, they're, they're preventing them from doing so. And so these are people who persecute others. And Jesus is saying, this, this is a terrible lot of people, and they're persecuting this church in Philadelphia, just like they did uh, the church in Smyrna. But I want you to notice something unique that he says to the church in Philadelphia. He said, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. So he's saying someday, 
because of your faithfulness and because of who I am as your God, I am going to make even your enemies fall at your feet. What this reminds me of is uh, in the book of Acts, we meet someone named Saul of Tarsus, who we now call the Apostle Paul. And he was one who would destroy the church any chance that he had until a day when the power and majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ himself knocked him on his back. He lost his sight. Later through prayer from a brother in the Lord, his sight was restored. And then he spent the rest of his life serving the church. And so he's trying to remind this church in Philadelphia that that is the kind of God they serve and that he's going to love them so well that this will happen for them. And that the door is open in front of them. But he knows that they're getting weary. He knows that they only have a little bit of strength left. And so in the next verse, he encourages them with these words. In verse 10, it says, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Now, this, Revelation 3.10, has become one of the most controversial verses in the entire scriptures. And I'll tell you why. It's all because of this hour of trial. What is the hour of trial? Before we talk about what the hour of trial might be in this passage, I want us to be reminded of a couple of things Pastor Joel told us in week one of this series. First of all, Revelation is written for us, but it wasn't written to us. It was written to the seven churches in Asia Minor that existed at that time. And so though we can learn a lot from it, it was not written to us in America in the 21st century. Also, Revelation is an apocalyptic prophetic letter. This means it reveals hidden mysteries. That's what apocalyptic means. It gives some insight into the end times. There is prophecy within this book. But also, it was written to a specific group of people in the first century. So it's good that we come towards the book of Revelation with a little bit of humility. With a little bit of understanding and openness. Knowing that there might be parts in this letter that are hard for us to understand. So what is the hour of trial? Now look, I've been hunting this down for literally weeks. (laughs) And uh, I'll tell you what. The best theological minds in Christian history cannot come to an agreement on what this means. Some believe that the hour of trial only applies to the church in Philadelphia because the letter was written to them and this is before we get to the part in the letter where it's addressed to anyone who's a believer. So some believe this only applies to that specific group of believers. There's others who believe that this this is applying to anyone who is faithful like the church in Philadelphia was faithful. So as long as you're a faithful believer that this promise would also uh, be yours. There are some who believe that the hour of trial spoken of here had to have come in the first century. It had to have been something that was happening around them in that season of history. There's others who believe that it is directly related to the end times tribulation. So what I would like to humbly submit to all of us is that if the best theological minds in Christian history cannot come to an agreement about what the hour of trial is, that instead of spending our time here today trying to dissect and figure out exactly what it refers to, that we instead focus on what God is promising here, that we don't miss it. Because that's what often happens in these moments. See, God tells us multiple times throughout the scriptures, you will have trouble in this life. I notice I didn't get any amens on that. But life is hard. It's difficult. We're going to have trouble in this life. But Jesus says, but take heart because I have overcome the world. But here's the reality. Becoming a Christian isn't necessarily going to make life easier. Will it make life better? I guarantee you it will. But it's not going to make it easier. If anything, at times, being a Christian makes life more difficult. It makes life more difficult because there are times where it would be easier to just go with whatever the culture is doing. 
There are times it would be easier to not speak the truth. There are times that it would be easier to not show grace. But we are called to be like Christ. And so it won't necessarily make life easier, but it is worth it. But what God is saying to the church here, and I think it's a truth that applies still today, is that there are certain trials that God will keep you from. See, God will allow us to go through difficulty. He will allow us to go through trials and temptations of many kinds. But there seems to be certain things that God will shield us from, will save us from walking through. Maybe you've seen that in your own life as you look back over your story and you see the moments where God saved you from things that had you kept going down that path, it would be a very different story. And if nothing else, we can take hope and heart in the truth that just as the angel of death passed over the Israelite homes in Egypt because they had put the blood of a lamb over their doorpost, that we as followers of Christ will pass through the hour of judgment that will come upon all of humanity of all time because we have been covered in the blood of the lamb in Jesus Christ our Lord. And we will pass through that hour of judgment into the new heavens and the new earth. And so there seems to be a promise for all of us here. But this only applies to those who are faithful believers. So what promise does Jesus give to those who are faithful believers in him? The promises keep coming. See, in verse 11, he says, I am coming soon. So hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I'll also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we have to remember this is the part of the letter that applies to anyone who would listen, anyone who has ears, anyone who would put their faith in Jesus Christ will be somebody who is victorious in the end. So this is the part of the letter that we know for sure applies to all of us. And so what is he promising here? Well, he says that your, his name is going to be written on us. I think this is one of those moments where Jesus is reminding us not who we are, but whose we are. That we belong to him. That we are his. That he's bought us at a price with his own blood. And he's reminding us of that reality. That his name will be written upon us for all of eternity. That he's claiming us as his own. In a world where sometimes we can be abandoned by others, Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. You are mine. So he's reminding them of this truth. But then he, he tells them that there'll be pillars in the temple of God. That's kind of an odd picture. Like, are we literally going to just be like holding up a roof in the temple for all of eternity? I think he's giving them a word picture here that's actually really powerful. He's saying, you will have a permanent place in my temple, in the new age, in the age to come, the new heavens and the new earth, you will have a permanent home there. But I think this language that he's using would have been even more powerful for those who lived in Philadelphia at that time. And here's why. This part of Asia Minor was actually prone to earthquakes. And these earthquakes would come and they would hit the city and massive buildings would fall. But you know what would remain after the earthquake? The pillars. That's why today you can go over to that part of the world and you can still see ancient ruins from Greece and Rome and you're going to mostly just see pillars because that's what would remain. And so what he is trying to remind this little church is that no matter what happens around you, no matter what the conditions are, that if you are someone who plants your feet on the rock of who Jesus Christ is, that you will stand the test, not just here, but for all of eternity. You will stand in my presence. That's what he's promising to anyone who would believe. That's his promise. So his encouragement to us is to hold on. 
to hold on. Maybe lately you've been tempted to let go. You've been holding on, but maybe lately you feel like you just want to let go. Maybe, maybe you've been walking in sobriety for some time now. Maybe uh, days or weeks, months, or maybe even years. But lately, the, the temptation's always there, but lately it feels like you have a larger temptation to give in to those old addictions. And there's something inside of you that says, I just don't know if I can hold on anymore. And you just want to let go. Jesus would say to you, hold on. For some of you, you're looking around the world and you're seeing everything that's happening and you're going, the world is literally going to hell in a handbasket and you're starting to actually doubt. You're starting to lose your faith. You're starting to let go. And Jesus would look at you and say, hold on. For some of you, you're in a relationship and you're trying to remain sexually pure but you're, you're at a point where you're wanting to give in to that desire before the appropriate time. And Jesus would look at you and say, hold on. And for some of you, you've been walking through depression, but lately, lately it feels like you don't even see the point of being alive anymore. You're not even really sure what you're holding on to anymore. And everything feels like darkness around you. You really can't even see light anymore. But I want to remind you that the scriptures tell us that our, to our God, even the darkness is as light. That he can meet you in that darkness. And he would look at you and he would say, don't let go. Hold on. Hold on. but he doesn't just tell us to hold on. He tells us to hold on to what we have. What do we have? What is it that we have as believers that we get to hold on to that's going to take us through these seasons of life? Well, there's an answer that comes to us out of the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter six, it tells us this. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. That's what we have. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul and it keeps us firm and secure. And for any of us who put our hope in Jesus and we hold on to that hope, God will honor us by bringing us into the age to come. And he'll also honor us in this life as we hold on to that hope. So how do we hold on to that hope and what happens? I want you to hear how God honors people who hold on to his hope. See, this little church in Philadelphia, they actually continued on for another 1,300 years. And then there was a time where the Turks invaded this part of Asia Minor. And uh, they, they took out every Byzantine Christian city that existed. But Philadelphia was the last one to be taken by the Turks. They held out. And when they finally came to terms with the Turkish army, the Muslim Turks who had just invaded and taken over Asia Minor gave them a situation that they didn't give to any other town in that entire vicinity, any other town in the Turkish Empire. They allowed them to retain free Christian worship with the ringing of church bells, which means it was loud and very public, and also public processions of worship down the street. This was allowed for no other town within the Turkish Empire, only this town. And still today, in this city, though it's a different name now, they still have Christians who worship week in and week out. Why does that matter? Because Jesus told them, the door is open in front of you and nobody can shut it except me. So even when the government fails, even when the systems fail, even when the culture fails, even when the world around you is going into chaos, the church will continue to move forward. That's what he's reminding them. 
And that is what history tells us is exactly what happened. This little church in Philadelphia is the picture of what it means for us to hold on. This actually reminds me of a speech, one of the most famous speeches of modern history. See, during World War II, after Dunkirk, Great Britain was unsure of their position in the war. And so Winston Churchill knew that he needed to bolster the nation and the empire. And so he got up in front of parliament and he delivered this speech. Here are his words. Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall into the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Followers of Christ, we shall never surrender. We shall not be overcome even when many old and famous Christian countries and churches fall into the grip or may fall into the grip of the enemy. We will fight on till the end. We will not be overcome. See, we are not overcome by evil. We overcome evil with good. Not only that, but let me remind you who our battle is against. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We will not give in to the enemy. We will, we will preach the gospel in the streets and in the fields. We will make disciples wherever we can find them. We will go on. We will not lose hope. We will hold on to what we have because Jesus is coming soon. In church, there are people right now in the grip of the enemy who are depending on us. Imagine all the generations that would have gone without a gospel witness if it wouldn't have been for this little church in Philadelphia. And right now, we don't, we don't, we don't fight on, we don't push forward only for ourselves. We do it for the many who will come after us. We do it for the many who right now are trapped by sin's deceitfulness here in our community and in our country and all around the world. We do it for them. But it will be difficult. Lately, I've had moments where I myself have wanted to give up hope, even if it's just for a moment. There are moments where the pain of my past creeps up on me and seeks to steal the joy that I have in the Lord and causes me to doubt all the good work that he's done inside of me. There are times where one of you will come to me for prayer or you'll reach out online. And I, I do, I pray for you. But then there's moments where you'll walk away and I'll just whisper to myself, God, why do they have to go through that? Why are they walking through that right now? And I don't get an answer, but I pray anyway. And then there are these times where, like what I read happened in Waukesha the other day. I read that and it feels like the enemy is winning. And it makes me want to punch a wall. And I just get so frustrated and sad, and there's moments where it feels hopeless. 
And it's in those moments that I have to remember the words of Jesus. Hold on. We must hold on to the hope that we have. So no matter what circumstances you are going through right now, no matter how the enemy is coming against you, do not be discouraged. Hold your ground. Because I have read the end of the book and Jesus has already won the war. He's already won. Jesus is the one who is holy and true. He's never been evil. He never will be. And there's no lie in him. In fact, his words are the words of life. And he holds the key in his hand. He has all the authority of heaven and earth. And someday justice will be done upon all of those who lived as if he didn't have that authority. But God will honor all those who did live in the truth that Jesus is king. And not only that, he is the one who has the door open in front of us. That we can continue to move forward, not because we've got it all together. Because I don't know about you, but I don't. It's because he has made a way in front of us that he has a door open for the church to continue to move forward until the final day. And when we have that hope that we never let go of, it's a hope that will never fail us because Jesus will never fail us. So we hold on to this hope. Now I want you to know how intentional our God is. We've been planning this Sunday for weeks, months, really. And uh, over the last few days, I've just been struck by the intentionality of our God, that he knows exactly what we need when we need it. Because some of you are aware, some of you might not be, but this Sunday marks the first Sunday of Advent on the Christian calendar. Now, we, we are a non-denominational church, but we participate in Advent because we believe it points us to an important gospel truth. See, the word Advent means arrival. So it's at this time of year we celebrate the first arrival of Jesus into the world, where he came in the form of a little child. But it's, it's also this time then that we remember that he then went on to live a life, died on a cross for our sins, rose from the dead and then ascended into heaven to prepare a place for us. And now we wait for his second advent, his second arrival, where he will make all things new. And it's in this season of history, this season of waiting, as we wait for him to come back, that we are reminded of the hope that we have. Because see, in the book of John, it tells us that light came into the world and the darkness couldn't comprehend it. The darkness couldn't overcome it. And that light continues to push through every age of human history until the day that Jesus comes back to fill the earth with his glorious light. And so this Sunday, we will light what's called the, the prophet's candle. But it's also called the candle of hope. We didn't plan that. That just happened. That God knew that on this Sunday, as many of us are reeling from tragedy that's happened in our own state, that we would need to read a letter that was about the church holding on to their hope. And then we would light the candle of hope as a testament to that truth. Because see, Isaiah told the people that the people who are walking around in darkness have now seen a great light. And that great light continues to pierce the darkness until Jesus returns. It's where we find our hope. And so in a moment, I'm going to light the candle of hope, the prophet's candle. And then after that, we're going to participate in a moment of prayer together. The prayer will come up on the screen and we'll participate in that together. And the part that you'll pray is label, labeled congregation. But here's what I'd say. As we come into this moment and we watch this candle be lit, whatever the Holy Spirit's been stirring up in you during this time, whatever his word has been speaking into your life, 
I pray that you would have a silent moment of prayer and just ask the Holy Spirit to continue to do what he's doing in your heart and in your life. So we'll light the candle and then we'll have a moment of prayer. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Lord, you are the light of the world. Amen. Heavenly Father, we long for your plan of rescue and redemption to be realized. Give us hearts that see your beauty and wait in hope for you to make all things good and new again. May your hope burn strong in our hearts, spreading hope to those around us. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.